It is 7.15 p.m. Uh, September 28th, 2021. I'm calling this meeting to order. Um, we do have a quorum by the skin of our teeth. And uh, dishes and modifications to the agenda. I have one to make, and um, that is for agenda item 6.01, discussion on police mental health with Senator Roboto. Um, I won't change it uh, to, make, uh, to say that um, Sunday will be speaking at 6.30, um, time certain. That's not stated on here because I hadn't verified that with him prior to which. So yeah, a motion to amend the agenda to uh, perhaps Sunday to speak at 6.30, time certain. Motion to do what you just said. <laughs> Seconded by Commissioner Comfort. All in favor, raise your hand and say aye. aye. That passes unanimously. And with that, I motion to enter executive session to discuss disciplinary actions. Uh, sorry, um, I'm just reading verbatim here um, some language from uh, the city attorney. I move into executive session to discuss disciplinary actions. Oh, sorry, one second. Welcome. The seat is right here, my man. And sorry, I'll, I'll restate that again. Um, I move to enter executive session to discuss disciplinary action against the public employees pursuant to 1 BSA 313A4 and invite our legal counsel and the acting chief of police and deputy into the session pursuant to 1 BSA 313B. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Grant. All in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 One abstention. Um, that time is 517 on that. Uh, I guess I would have to do a, actually we don't. Mm -hmm. All right then, we are in executive session. Uh, 632, um, back from recess. And we are going, moving with uh, the time certain amendment, and that is um, discussion on police mental health with Senator Roboto. So, thank you for being with us, and uh, you have the floor, sir. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I think the last time I had the opportunity to address the commission was uh, a few years ago, um, obviously before COVID-19, um, and in the field of psychology, we we're still trying to figure out the effects of COVID-19. Um, being a mental health clinician at Ground Zero, that was the first time the field of psychology was trying to play catch up to an event that was happening uh, close and dear to our heart, and now is another time. And so you can imagine that not only our own personal lives, but uh, the profession of law enforcement is also struggling to adapt to some of these changes. Um, I've given Susie uh, the uh, outline of the program. This is in our going into our 11th year. It's called the CARES program. It stands for Career Assistance, Resources, Education, and Support to the members of the Burlington Police Department, both sworn personnel. I'm so sorry. Mila, I'm sorry. You have to keep the door open. You have to keep it open. Yeah, we can't. We can't close the door. How about partially? Sorry, uh, open meeting lock work. My apologies. That's OK. I can, I can talk pretty loud. <laughs> Um, so, you know, um, 11 years ago when we started the program, if you look at the profession today, not many things have changed. Uh, there's still a high uh, suicide rate within the profession. Uh, officers are still, still repeatedly going to high, intense, uh, stressful calls. Um, there's a mass shooting in this country every day. So the profession is still dealing with the same uh, ills that it was dealing with 11 years ago. What I think is really different um, as I speak today for uh, the Burlington Police Department in particular is in the field of organizational psychology, uh, the research is pretty abundant when we look at the perceived level of organizational support. Now, when I use the word organization, I, I do not mean within the four walls of the Burlington Police Department. Um, my hat's off to Chief Murad in all that he's been trying to do to keep the morale up and keep the officers focused on the mission of that department. As a former member of the Burlington Police Department, it's a rich tradition of serving this community. 
I can tell you in 1981 when I drove down Main Street, I had said to a friend of mine in the front seat, I said, I want to move here someday, and it took me seven years to get to Burlington. I have been all over the world teaching what I'm going to speaking about today, and Burlington is my home. It's sad to see such a rich tradition in the police department uh, go through what it's going through today. So from a mental health perspective, how do we provide services to an organization that is really, really struggling? Um, the profession itself is still filled with a large stigma about asking for help. If you ask for help, it could be deemed as a sign of weakness. There still is a culture that talks to the suck it up mentality. But when we look at a more broader spectrum and we try to apply some of the theory to how to help the Burlington Police Department, I can't not look at organizational psychology which says that when officers have a poor perception of support, um, it does affect their ability to um, be engaged with the community. It affects their overall well-being. It also affects their ab ability to feel valued by their police department. It also impacts their ability to find satisfaction in their job. The research is also abundant when we look at job satisfaction as a protective factor towards stress and trauma. The profession has a PTSD rate three times that of the general public at 35%. We have three times as many police officers every year take their own lives than who die at the hands of felons. I have been in that building up the street. And um, I've taken the guns. This happens a lot. <laughs> Um, and um, Deputy Chief Lebrecht was one of the officers who helped me help an officer who was going to take his own life. So, that being said, whew, okay. I'm here to answer questions, to see how I can be of some help. Um, and one thing I think, and Suzanne will, will connect with this, she was my social work teacher. Mm -hmm. um, Shh, don't tell everybody. <laughs> The profession, I'm uh, sorry, not the profession, the Burley Police Department, we serve about 12% of the officers. Um, in the world of employee assistance programs, police officers are seeking only about 3% of mental health services. So um, we do, we're doing the best job we can. Not everybody in that department will talk to me, and that's in every department. Um, I realize that as, as a person, as a human, that not everybody is going to be able to connect with me. Um, why do I see the, the numbers dwindling and people not coming to ask for help? Um, what we know in the field of child protection work is that social workers have joined the profession 100 years ago and the job demands were so much more than the job resources. I created a program at the Department of Children and Families, a, a peer support team to help support social workers and when I would try to do interventions and support social workers, they would say that, to me that I could never even begin to unpack the stress or the trauma because I don't have the capacity to put it all back together and go to work the next day so I can earn a living for my family. The Burlington Police Department has moved into that realm. Officers are not seeking help because they don't have the capacity to unpack the stress and the trauma that they experience. There's another thing that we probably uh, don't think about, and that is there's a level of betrayal trauma that officers are feeling in terms of all of the officers that are at this department who may have strived every day to do a good job feel like they are part of some kind of paradigm that where they don't feel valued and they don't feel worthy. And that only creates this dilemma where they're holding on for dear life. Um, I get emotional because I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's why I do this work. This work is so important, and I realize that many of us who are trying to hold on, whether it's staffing issues or no staffing issues, we have to remember that we have completely depleted the spirit 
of the Burlington Police Department, and these men and women are giving us everything they can to maintain serving the community. There's another thing in order, organizational psychology that I think speaks to this, and that's called work engagement. The ability for officers to be empathic, compassionate, and respectful to their community. We are asking men and women who have depleted their own psychological well-being because of the strains and stresses that's taking place right now, and then we're asking them to go to calls where a 14-year-old may have harmed themselves, or they go to a call where they see a grieving and crying family, and then we expect them to turn around and go to another call and provide the best care possible. That's the spirit of the men and women of that department. You know, we are such a small organization that we can identify the bad apples quickly, and we get rid of them quickly. And so it's all of these dimensions that play a role in the overall well-being and the function of that police department. Thank you. Oh, uh, for commissioners to ask uh, for other questions. Uh, so, can you uh, please explain that? What, what was your uh, your duties for the police department? What was my what? Duties. What were your duties for the police department? And, and so, um, sure. I provide, and I handed out a, a brief that talks about the services. Yeah. I provide uh, mental health counseling um, for the police officers as one aspect of what I do. I also provide guidance through their career in terms of people staying interested in staying at the department and, and achieving different avenues, whether it's detectives or K-9 or, or any other aspect of what the department offers people in terms of different positions. I also assist in critical incidents. When there's a critical incident and officers are affected, um, we respond. I have a team. I also have a, a, a center. It's called the Vermont Center for Respond to Wellness. So I have a team of trained clinicians, I have 14 trained EMDR cl clinicians, that would respond to a critical incident and provide interventions soon after the traumatic event so we can um, help officers uh, recover from trauma quickly uh, and hopefully prevent PTSD from developing. So, I mean, what, what, what advice would you give all of us in the room at a time of really important racial reckoning? Uh, we have a predominantly white police department. Um, that's enough to say. Wow. So I, I go for the juggle. You know, I may have, I may have told you this, right? Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I get graded. No. <laughs> um, about three years ago, I was given an opportunity to go to Northern Ireland, very white, um, and work with the police service of Northern Ireland, and. The, the, my colleague is a psychiatrist, and his brother is the archbishop in Derry, Ireland, where we know that there's a conflict going on every day. And he asked me to go up, and he asked me if I want to do some peace building. And I, and I looked at him, and I was a little bit astonished, but I knew what he was getting at. As a trauma expert, um, we can't even have a discussion unless we both recognize the trauma that sits on at the other ends of the table. Because we view the conversation through this lens where I may have to feel like I have to protect myself or defend myself, and that doesn't open us up for good communication. So my, I saw what my role was, and my role was to tell these two men that were sitting at the table in this coffee shop with a cobblestone alleyway with, a, with the deacon sitting there and my other friend sitting here, and I said to them, you know, we can't even have the conversation until we do the work around how for generations we have been traumatized and we need to bring that and put that on the table. That allows us to have a more constructive conversation about what do you need? What do I need? I mean, all of our relationships are based on need, right? Having my needs met. You know, when I was a cop at Burlington, you know, a need was having a cruiser that didn't have a hole in the floorboard, <laughs> or an FM radio, or we got radios. Um, but the needs today, like, we do a great job at providing tools. We don't do such a good job at the emotional and social support that officers need. 
Did I answer your question? Half of it. Okay. Yeah, I What's think the other half? The other half is the community. Right. Somehow we, we, we really need to work to bring us all together. You know, I don't think there's one officer in that police department who is not open to sitting down, and I just want to say this one word, listening. That's where it starts. We've got to learn to listen. Now, I'm really out of my league here. So anyway, that, that's my perspective. Um, uh, I believe that we, we are very lucky to have the quality of police officer that's in this department. I, I go all over and I talk to cops in so many different areas. By the way, you never want to go to South Jersey and mm -hmm. talk to those cops. Boy, they are really in the dark ages. So, you know, we are really fortunate to have the people who are still here, and that's the problem. We're going to lose really good people. Sonny, thanks for joining us. Um, Thank you. So, do you... Um, do you have an opinion or help at all in terms of the work environment? Like, do you work with the department on, or the um, BPO, uh, BPOA on shift, length of shifts or days? I know there's a lot of overtime going on, and I'm just wondering what kind of involvement or, you know, what are your opinions on all of that? So, you know, I mean, there's also research to that too. We realize that the 10 and 12 hour shifts are not healthy. Um, but, you know, where we uh, sometimes, and, and this is part of the, the challenge of the profession, is that sometimes we don't have the staffing to do different kinds of shift schedules. If you ask me my professional opinion on mental wellness and overall well-being, I would say that um, a 10-hour shift is probably the maximum shift we would want officers to work, and we want them to have an extended time off so they could recharge their, their battery uh, think about work-life balance, uh, and then have the enthusiasm and the energy to come back because, you know, this profession will do so many things to us. It is not uncommon for one officer to do a 22-hour shift because at the end of their shift, something happened. And then we require them to stay and perform. And I've been there, and, and that's emotionally exhausting, it's cognitively exhausting, and it's physically exhausting, and the rebound from a shift like that takes three weeks. So when you talk about, you know, reduce shift hours, you gotta have more people. So, so you know, it, it, one feeds the other, right? So the job demand, right, has to meet the job resources. And I think what the restructuring did is it created this really imbalance, you know, more demand and less resources. And so when we think about we want officers to be engaged with the community, we want officers to have a positive mindset, we want officers to be able to um, interact in crisis situations, whether it's you know, uh, a, a domestic violence situation or a mental health call, we want office to ha officers to have that capacity that their emotional brain isn't overworking, that they're not going into fight or flight when they don't need to, right? But that's what the repeated exposure to trauma does to them. Right? So the killer in this profession is not the one really high stressful call. It's the repeated exposure to death, dying, and grieving families that these officers have to integrate into themselves. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone home after an infant death and sat in my son's bedroom and make sure that he was breathing before I could go to bed. These are the lives that these men and women live you know, on a regular basis, and, and I don't have to tell you how much, all you gotta do is ask the chief for the call log. You know, how many deceased bodies do they go to? How many death notifications are they giving, right? That's the stuff that's impactful, and then if we don't give them the ability to recharge their battery, to get the sleep that they need, right? To go to the training that they need for career advancement. Think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. These men and women are holding on to their basic needs right now. And then the second need in that, in, that, in that pyramid is safety. And you know, trauma, right? Think about trauma. You can't treat people for their trauma unless they feel safe. Thank you. Are there trauma-reducing routines that a department can take on, you know, on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, you know, at the center, by the way, because um, the 
department and I have a contract, we offer all of the services we provide at the center that we have for free. So we have mindfulness coaches, and it can be done in person or virtually. We have yoga classes, which can be done virtually and in person. Um, we have um, a TSR manual, which is a, not only a self-care manual, but also, by the way, we have a peer support team in the department. The peer support team is almost non-functional right now because the peer support members are so exhausted. They can't even lend support to their peers anymore. But when we started the team three or four years ago, the team was doing, uh, forget now, I would say probably anywhere between 40 and 50 assists every month. That no longer exists because there's no capacity. So yes. Um, there are things um, we can bring in other partners from the community uh, to, to be you know in the community room and have officers take advantage of we have nutritionists uh, on staff that we can do healthy living stuff so really there are stuff we hand out a newsletter to the department every every month to and the chief uh, disseminates it so officers know what we're doing there are tips in the newsletter about cooking sleeping compassion fatigue burnout so we're trying to you know, do as much as we can, given that COVID has changed some of the way that we deliver services. Uh, so I was just, I briefly was able to skim over um, care, Dr. McCare was able to read in, uh, in depth, so trying to pay attention to what uh, we had to say. It says it started in 2011. Is it a, a yearly recurring program? Yes. And how has kind of been officer um, access to it? Uh, has it kind of stayed steady? Has it gone up? Has it gone down? Yeah. So um, that's a great question. I think we consistently somewhere stay between 10 and 15 percent of the department's utilization, which um, is much higher than what the state's EAP services provide to first responders. And so. Uh, in that program, there are opportunities to do roll call training, psychoeducation, um, as well as responding to those critical incidents. And so those critical incidents give us an opportunity to provide interventions, right, that, which is like psychological first aid and psychological second aid to help officers mitigate the, the effects of stress or traumatic stress. So I would say since, so we're going in our 11th year, we consistently stay around that 12 to 15 percentage range. Um, and I don't know, so why isn't, why can't we get more? And, and why is it going down? I know why it's going down, because I think officers have zero capacity right now. Um, how do we make it go up? I don't know if we really can make it go up, because I, what I would say is that in a, in a normal time, that most of the officers that we put through a really rigorous hiring, hiring process are officers that we find um, have the tolerance to deal with the, the high stress calls and, and the repeated exposure. That's why we have 35% PTSD rate and not anything that's higher. So um, I think there are pro protective factors that exist within the department. Uh, Chief Murad is a perfect example of somebody who has come into a really tough situation and provided the support and the leadership to its officers and there is this sense of trust and open communication um, and that is huge, especially right now where we're feeling like, you know, like this, the ship may be sinking. We got people bailing from, from the organization because from the officer's perspective, there's, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. And it doesn't matter what I do as an organization to say, hey, we, we offer services, we want to help you. The person has to f have the capacity to go after their services. The other thing, they have to have the courage to acknowledge what's going on with them. So I wish I could increase that number. Thank you. So when you were talking about Northern Ireland, you were talking about trauma on both sides. Yes. So I'm, I'm coming back to the community that we live in now, and at the moment in history we're in right now, with the, rec the racial reckoning. Where do we go with that? And I know you don't have, you, so you're talking as a professional with your best ideas at the moment, but I think that's a, a really integral spot that we are in right now. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, really outstanding people in the department, and we have outstanding leadership, um, and we have community members, you know, who are struggling, um, particularly people of color in our community. So we have trauma and trauma on both sides. Where do we go, and how do we get there? 
So, um, you know, in a perfect world where we can all have all the resources we want, um, I would suggest that we start, um, you know, we start some peace building and, and start building relationships. And, you know, if you go back, so the law enforcement profession has done this before. You know, if you go back to Neighborhood Watch, and Chief, you probably know more about it than I do. Neighborhood Watch was a program that engaged the community in you know, self-governance and watching out for our neighbors. And, and one of the things that, law, that the policing profession did was to build those relationships in those communities. When I was with Burlington, I was part of the COPS program, so community-oriented policing. And we all took an area of the city, and I was responsible for the hill sections, all the noise. And so I used a creative way to solve that problem. I don't think that, well, I do think, I do think that there is a, a great opportunity to reach out to the community in various ways, groups, or however you want to do it, and offer an opportunity to come to the table for a restorative process. So, and the reason why I say this is, um, I run a 10-week program, and actually just give me an idea. So I run a 10-week program. Uh, I do it in schools, I do it in police departments, and we call it support circles. People come for 10 weeks, two hours every week, and we engage people in the process, a collaborative process. I'm not the expert, I'm just a collaborator with people in this group, and we have them think about, so in the, in the world of education, you know, have them think about, you know, uh, what what is the challenges for them in the career? How can we help them rekindle the spark of love and teaching again? You know, how do we deal with it? And by the way, teachers are just like cops. They're public servants. And they feel the same pressures from the public. And so, you know, that's that's a concept, a concept where we can invite community the community in as well as officers in and create this this dialogue around the restorative process and get the conversation going. And from the conversations comes the ideas. And from the ideas comes the collaboration where, hey, my friend over there, I'm like, you come with me. On Tuesday night, we're going over here, right? And all of a sudden, now you can build something that I think could be really effective. Sorry to have my back. No, no, that's fine. Um, I. Um, I really like some of these ideas. Um, I have, everybody knows I'm, I'm the one who comments a lot on lack of public engagement. And I think we're really seeing the harm that's been done in the relationship between the community and officers. Mm -hmm. And this, whole us versus them narrative mm. that unfortunately mm -hmm. is sometimes pushed upon us, mm -hmm. which isn't okay. I mean, and, and the, um, the support circle, you know, and peace building. I just feel if we've been, I got involved with the, the con uh, special committee to review policing policies and then on the commission. And I've been talking about it all this time and I just feel like certain things aren't moving forward. Mm -hmm. And now we're in this period of extreme stress with COVID and overall incidents going down, but certain types of incidents going up. Um, and it's like if some of these things aren't really started to involve the community, I feel it's gonna get worse. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's a, a lack of appreciation on one side for work that's being done and that's needed and then there's a complete distrust on, on the other side mm -hmm. and then there's those people in the middle who are trying to get help but can't get help and don't always get talked to appropriately and and that can be a source of stress, but it still is like you can't talk to people a certain way, no matter how you're feeling. But um, yeah, I think this is all great. How do we get the, this out in the public? How do we really start these things? So yeah, maybe we can't get two hours 
but but what do we do to get a half an hour mm -hmm. to to start a process where there's this just communication? I think I just think the communication is so um, it's just really difficult right now. Um, and I'm having, I, I was really feeling earlier the way you were feeling because I, I had to walk out of here during our executive session. I got so upset. And I'm feeling upset now because I'm like, this is, this is all great. And, and why can't we, we make this happen? And why can't we really promote this in a way so that people know what's going on, mm -hmm. right? Even with some of the incidents, I don't think people really understand what it means to go into a situation where someone's OD and they didn't make it. Like, people don't think about that. Mm -hmm. And um, those are real things that occur. Um, but that's not communicated in the way that it should be. That's right. That's right. And that's a big issue that the department needs to, to deal with. And they do need additional resources to do that. Like I said before, the chief shouldn't be doing tweeting. He, he should not be tweeting. Someone should be in charge of public relations. Took me a minute to figure out what that and, was. And, yeah, it's, it's in charge of, of, of public relations and overseeing these programs and having a plan and being able to act on the plan. And hopefully we can we can get to that point. But that's what I wanted to mention. And thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. And you know, um, I'm only one little voice, and uh, I may have some crazy ideas, but. You know, I think being a, uh, a student of Susie, she's taught me enough to um, be moxie enough to tell, to say what I think. And I think, you know, if uh, I always, I always follow what I'm passionate about, and I may not always do it right, but the reality is, is that I always had this idea. And and some of you folks may know Sam Jackson. Um, Sam and I, I know Sam since he's 10 years old. Uh, what the BHS? Back yeah. Today? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a really cute story about Sam and his brother. So I got called to the Burlington Mall. mall. The, the, one of the store owners was upset. Sam's brother was involved. The store owner didn't know the whole story. So I just said, hey, why don't I just take you home? And so I put him in my car. And you can imagine a cop car showing up on somewhere in the old North End. And Sammy's out on the street playing. And he runs to the size of this big. He runs and gets his mom. And his mom comes out. And I take his brother out. And I said, hi, are you Mrs. Jackson? He says, yeah. And I said, Got a good kid here. I don't know what happened at the mall, but he's not in trouble. And Sam remembered that. And now I'm going to tell you another true story. I left BPD and went to the state police because nobody told me that I would get burned out and what burnout is. So I went for greener pastures. And then it wasn't three months with the state police. It was the same stuff. And this is the work. This is why I do the work. There was a big brawl in, in front of Nectis, and Burlington's calling for mutual aid, and I happen to be up on the highway, and so I come down the street, and I get out of my cruiser, and there's like 40 or 50 people and five Burlington cops trying to control this crowd. And the minute I got out of my cruiser, the crowd came off the sidewalk and started to surround me, and then all of a sudden you heard this big voice, leave the trooper alone, leave the trooper alone, and all of a sudden the crowd backed up, and it was Sammy. And him and I have had this really connected relationship, and him and I have had this conversation. But I don't know how to do the resources. Like, I don't know, like, so Sammy and I have this, this love to do this work, you know, and he's part of this community. Uh, and so there's a, that's an outlet, and he's got a bigger mouth than I do. Yeah, and there's, there's certain other resources that are available too, but it's like, can't get anybody to, to focus, to focus. And, Every day it's getting worse. And at some point, everyone, and it's interesting what you said about greener pastures, because there's, there's no greener pastures. You're right. There is no place you're going to go that this isn't an issue, uh, the issues that we're facing, or won't be an issue. Right. You go to a, part, a department, and maybe they're not actively, but you know, we're, when you think of all of other Vermont towns and their departments and then the state police and all the issues that they're having, there's no, there isn't. It, there just isn't. It just may seem that it's calmer in one location for now, but that doesn't mean right. anything. You know, the diversification is coming. It, and, it's every um, organization of every type across every sector. Yeah. Right? And it's, it's everybody in the community. And so, you know, it's, it's really difficult stuff, you know, for white people. And it's a lot more difficult for people of color to be at the receiving end of it over and over and over. 
and we have to deal with it. You know, I, I don't know how we how we have a conversation. You know, uh, all of us in this room about this issue in an honest way, um, and figure out make some strategies to go forward. Um, you, my psychotherapist friends in the room may find this really interesting. I have a colleague. His name is Mark Nickerson. He's one of EMDR's uh, trainers. Um, he wrote a book called The Cultural Competence Using EMDR-Based Therapy. My apologies, what's that EMDR? EMDR stands for uh, the, a psychotherapy that I use. It's a trauma treatment. It stands for eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. I don't know if we wanted to get into that much. Right, but, thank you. But Mark wrote a book, and it's called Cultural Competency Using EMDR Therapy. And when we're doing direct trauma work, we're, we're helping people access the irrational internal belief that, uh, that developed from the traumatic event. Mark wrote a book about treating the external beliefs. Mm. The belief I have outside of me, people I come in contact with, right? And it's all about cultural competency. Um, I went to, actually, he did the training at the Burlington Community Health Center a few years ago, and he shows a video of him working with a, 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 a man of color. And the man was talking about his experiences. And I think that's another avenue that's untapped. Mark is an exceptional trainer. I'm not saying that Mark would come up and teach therapists, but Mark would. could pro provide a program for all of us, right? To say, what is this cultural competence and what is this therapy? And I know we have, you know, um, you know uh, we have trainings that try to address this, but the trainings are directive. Tell me what I need to know, and then I'm going to go away. Mm -hmm. When you look at it from the lens of having people look at their external beliefs, we're really asking them to come from within and notice that, right? And so EMDR therapy is a therapy that stimulates the two hemispheres, the emotional brain and the rational brain, and it increases the neural communication for us to process information. Wow, now I notice, wow. I have, a, I have a belief about you, right? And I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that. And, and that's how you heal trauma. Is you, like EMDR is based on the premise that we all have an adaptive information processing ability. Once we notice it, then we can heal. You know, and I know I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but no, I've, this I've, is had, so important. I've had these conversations with Mark, saying, Mark, you need to develop something so that we can take this into a classroom and not tell people what their biases may be, but us, us help facilitate for people the ability to see the bias, right? And that's where the healing comes in because it's not me, you know, kind of nudging or putting something up on the screen and saying, well, you know, when we do this, it's us saying, thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to heal, to become a better person. You know, when I'm treating police officers for their trauma, I say to them all the time, man, we're working on healing your humanity because they see the worst in human behavior. You know, and so EMDR is an amazing psychotherapy, a modality that has changed my career. It's changed the lives of so many people. It actually changed the law in Vermont. So, um, and it can actually be, be something useful in this. If we could come together as a think tank and think about, so what are the things that we can do Right? I'd love to have a class of 50 police officers and say, hey, listen, we're going to go through this. And what are you talking about? And I'm talking about what are your external beliefs that you're not aware of? That might be a really good starting place. OK, Chief, put it on a calendar. <laughs> so anyway, just some ideas I have. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sunny, for coming yeah, and for sharing you. your wisdom with us. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Okay. I'm Thank sorry. You. Well, one thing I have, I spoke. I just there's a time. Yeah. yeah. I'm recognizing it. <laughs> um, I'm Stan Baker. I'm um, Archdeacon of the Diocese, Episcopal Diocese of Vermont. I'm at work at the Cathedral of St. Paul. When I'm not with this on, I'm a psychotherapist like him. I'm fully trained in EMDR. Mark Nickerson and I were in a men's group together 15 years ago. Great. I was Great. at the training at the health center. Um, and I'm working right now on combining EMDR with child psychotherapy with a guy from uh, Austin, Texas named Marshall Lyles. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's not why I'm here. I'm here basically to support what I'm hearing from Sonny, which is not why I came. 
you have a letter from me on behalf of the Social Justice Committee of the Cathedral, the Episcopal Cathedral. I'm here to support the idea of a mental health summit. Before I was in private practice, I was one of the clinical directors at Howard Center and was the oversight, clinical oversight for the Developmental Services Crisis Center before that, mental health director down at Middlebury. So I've had a lot of experience in the community mental health system. And I think the idea of bringing together all, many of the parties in this community that serve people with mental health issues is really important at this point because this issue goes beyond the police department. Yeah. This issue goes to lack of mental health support for people in our community. And it was a problem before the pandemic. It is way worse now. You can just see it and hear it and feel it. My clients tell me that and they see it in our church goers. So we need to expand we need to support the police department in learning new ways to deal with mental health issues and also their own burnout that you so beautifully talked about. But we also need to bring together all of the parts of our community that deal with mental health and together come up with some kind of solution which also speaks to the systemic piece that you are bringing up. How do we talk to each other? How do we bring together the police, the mental health workers, the citizens on the street, how do we bring together all these groups? And I think a mental health summit is a good way to start, which is why our social justice committee, two of our folks are here as well, Bob Wright and Suki Rubin, really support the idea of a mental health summit. And we can bring whatever resources we have in our diocese and the cathedral to that if space is needed or other kinds of support are needed. So I don't have a lot to say, except I, have, I guess I have an or on each side here. I have a or, or in the church side and an or in the mental health side. And um, I see this sometimes when crisis is looming, when things are at their worst, it's also the opportunity to change. It's that time when we realize what we most need to see and what we most need to change. So I don't see this as a hopeless time. I see this as a time for hope given some of the resources you're talking about, Sonny, and, and the willingness of the department and of this group of citizens to make change. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, really, thank you, everybody, for listening to my spiel. I apologize for getting emotional, but you know that this work is so passionate to me. And Never apologize. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. All right. Uh, concludes that agenda item 6.01. Uh, we are going to jump back into the original agenda, and we are at 3.01 now, which is approving the minutes of last meeting. Uh, yeah, minutes from last meeting. Um, I motion that we adopt the minutes as I learned. I have a second from Susie. Sorry, we get this timing now. Second by Susie. All in favor of approving the minutes from last meeting, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All right. Uh, well, I was going to have you abstain since you weren't here, so I have to do a roll call on that one. Uh, Milo? Aye. 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 All right. I just want to reiterate that Stephanie is not here because she's having internet issues because not everybody was in the room at the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, moves us on to agenda item 4.01, which is public forum at this point. So I invite anybody in the public to want to speak. Uh, you have the floor. You already heard from me. I, I already <laughs> did hear from you. I just want, yeah, I can just think about it. And uh, do you mind just stating your name for the office uh, for the record? Sorry. Yes, I'm uh, Robert Wright, Robert Wright, president of Burlington, and also a member of the Jubilee Justice Committee. Uh, and I just would really like to, uh, to second everything that uh, Stan has said about the, uh, how strongly we support what we see as your, your initiative to get some help for, uh, for, for mental health services all around, for, for, for the general public, 
and for the police, and for the police. Uh, I'll be quick about this. I just wanted to say that I have, I have seen a very serious situation with a neighbor. Uh, I actually called the police. And I didn't see what they did. Things quieted down afterwards. But based on what I heard before that and the violence before they showed up, I'm thinking, what's it got to do to them? police to see this day after day after day, time after time. You know, what kind of help do they get? They need some help. So I, I just leave it at that. Thank you. And anybody else from the public that wants to speak now is the time. <laughs> Not seeing anybody else, uh, close that uh, agenda item, moving on to 5.01, which is the chief's report. That uh, the floor is the chief mayor. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take this down to, to be audible. Um, the I, I had a presentation, but I don't have computer access and can't get it up. And, and Shannon can't get into the systems uh, these systems here from remote either. So unfortunately, I won't be able to share it. Uh, I'm going to reference a couple pieces of it though, because and, and then share it with everyone afterwards, um, because it had some I feel important data uh, about some of these topics that we're talking about. Um, uh, just as a recap of the things that have happened since we, we last met, uh, this past weekend, we uh, John King retired. John King was the manager of the Parking Enforcement Division, uh, and prior to that, he was a police officer. He was a police officer from uh, for 56 years. So he, he was hired in, the, the, in 1965. Um, he uh, served 23 years, uh, excuse me, 26 years as a Burlington police officer, rising to the rank of commander, which is what we now call a deputy chief. Um, he then uh, did 30 years as the director of the parking enforcement uh, division, so uh, which which last year transitioned over to DPW, but was a part of the BPD for the vast bulk of that time. His tenure constitutes more than a third of the history of the Burlington Police Department, which is just extraordinary, extraordinary. And I think that one of the wonderful things that we were able to see in that um, is is not just a testament to John and, and to his wife, Mitchie, who had to put up with, with that length of a career and has been wanting him to hang it up for, for quite some time now, uh, but it's a testament to the community that he served, too, uh, to, to be willing to give that much to, to this place, I think, is a testament to this place that we all uh, that we all serve. Um, he had some amazing stories about what policing was for him. Uh, his first day was a, in the chief. He was one of three hires, first hires in several years after a very large scandal at the department. During which it had, during that period it had winnowed and gotten smaller. His police training was a day in the chief's office to learn the map of Burlington a day in the chief's office to learn the municipal code, and a day in the chief's office to learn the VSA Vermont statutes. That was it. There was no academy. There was no anything else. They gave him a gun, gave him the keys to his prowler, and out he went. And he could only enforce within Burlington. It is a very different place uh, in those years since John King has, you know, became a police officer. Um, we're looking to do some facility improvements. Uh, we're trying to get some photographs of all the officers to put them up in a internally so that we can all see who we are and, and who's there and then make that public as well. Um, we talked this week uh, or over the past couple weeks since we last met, we, we had a, a long discussion with the Howard Center about protocols for emergency evaluations or EEs. Uh, taking people into custody involuntarily when they're exhibiting uh, a danger to themselves or others through a mental health episode. Um, we had a discussion with the Burlington School District about uh, what we're going to be doing in the absence of SROs uh, since we don't have that position any longer. Um, we have uh, conditional offers out to all three SL positions that we were authorized by the uh, City Council. My, that was the pilot plan that called for three. My build out of that plan would be six. Uh, I would love the opportunity to bring those aboard, but obviously we're going to see what we get with this pilot. But those three positions are now uh, ostensibly filled. The training is beginning for one. We're, we're still kind of working through. The hiring process takes a while, but the positions are filled, and uh, I'm going to be discussing with HR taking down that posting soon. Uh, great position. $60,000 start um, goes up to $72,000. I think we had a, we had plentiful applicants for that. So should we need to reopen it, or should I be should we be allowed to bring more aboard to the city? I, I'm confident that there is a pool of applicants for that position. 
who want to work for the city, who want to be able to partake in this work. We have four CSOs in various stages of the employment process, uh, people to whom we've given conditional offers, uh, and that they're in the background checks, et cetera. Um, that's a terrific position too. Starts at 47,000, uh, goes out to 56. Uh, very, very important something for uh, us to be able to develop new capacities for um, unarmed response, for un unsworn officers. Uh, and uh, we're hopeful that they will be able to help us address what we currently are unable to address, which is a significant volume of what we call priority three calls for service. We simply can't go to those anymore, and we're routinely uh, unable to, to, to go to those. Um, and that brings us to the, the, the biggest news that we had this uh, over the past week, month, which was last night's uh, unanimous acceptance by the, the City Council of the retention initiative incentive, excuse me, the retention incentive and recruitment incentive. And that was a huge moment for us. I, I, I was I'm tremendously grateful to the council for, for that. Um, it, it's not exactly what the mayor and I asked. The mayor was very, very clear about his support for that and his, his belief that we need something like that in order to uh, get us into a position of, of stabilizing so that we can grow from where we are. Uh, and yet it, the, unanimity, the unanimity of it was the important part. It, it was a, a statement, I believe, that there is uh, a sense of a value from the community about what officers do and the role that officers have. And some of the things that Sonny was speaking about, um, I think last night's decision uh, you know, says something about that. And so uh, really happy about that because we are in a, in a tough spot with regard to staffing. And this would have been one of the pictures I would have shown you in the first slide, um, which is that we are down to uh, 68 actual officers. Uh, I have two who are on terminal leave, which is 70, but they're gone. Uh, and they're, they'll come back for one day each in order to just close out their vacation time. So we are at 68. And I'm below that because there are three officers, two who are on long-term military leave, deployed, not available to us, not just weekend work, and one who's on a long-term injury. Also, not just an injury like, you know, sprained an ankle during a foot pursuit, but a long-term medical injury from which she can only be on administrative duty. So uh, those three are not available to us, which really puts us at 65. And the 65 is, in, is important, not for the incentive or the hiring, because I, I I'm not going to hire those positions. They are positions. I, I hope they come back. I hope that, that the injured officer can heal. But they are not things that we can use in our deployments. And so when we think about how we deploy and who we have available for different kinds of roles, that's the 65, and that's where the 65 matters, certainly to me and to the deputy chiefs who work on, on our deployment. We have a contractual obligation to keep a certain number of officers in detective bureau, and frankly, a workload obligation as well. It, it can't function below a certain level. We have uh, requirements by the federal government and by the TSA uh, to keep certain numbers of officers at the airport based on the number of gates that there are there, and so it can't take from that. And the only place that we lose from every time we lose an officer ultimately is USB, which is the Uniformed Services Bureau, which is patrol, which are the people who answer calls for service from the public. And so uh, that is a, a real challenge for us. Um, I would have had some pictures of that and some pictures of where we are. Uh, we are you know, drastically down with regard to uh, overall incident volume. It's, it's still trending down. It's picked up a little bit over the past uh, two months. Um, I had some great charts that Jono prepared for me, did run a wonderful work as always. I'm sorry, Jono. Um, uh, but one of the things I wanted to point to talk about were a couple categories that are really up. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of them. They, they, they're a great visual. I, again, I will share it and post it. But the, the mental health issue, uh, we are up over last year. And last year was extraordinarily high compared to other years. And mental health issue is a specific category in our uh, computer-aided dispatch system called Valcor. It's when a person calls in and the person identifies this. Well, I believe this is a mental health issue. Or dispatch is able to discern from the report. That sounds like a mental health issue. Or maybe the officer gets to the scene and recategorizes it after the fact. But that means that the primary issue with the incident was a mental health issue. On top of that, we have a checkbox for mental health so that any incident can end up being a mental health checkbox incident. It could be something that's completely unrelated. It could be just if you believe as an officer that there's a mental health component in this incident of noise complaint or this incident of public intoxication or this incident of, of a robbery for that matter, uh, you can check that checkbox. 
And um, we have seen a, you know, a real change in that. I have full year data from 2016 through 2020, again, provided by Jono, uh, that says that we, in 2020, were, we had the, the largest number of uh, mental health related incidents. So that's uh, the mental health issue call and the mental health checkbox combined and then disaggregated for overlap. Because sometimes over officers say, well, if it's a mental health issue, I guess I better check the checkbox too. And other officers say, no, I don't have to do that. It's already an issue. So that we have to disaggregate that, and we did. Um, and one of the interesting things we, we see is that it's, it's not a huge portion of our overall volume of, of events, right? So it is mental health related incidents uh, as a percentage of all incidents, 5.4% in 2016. 6.0% in 2017, 5.7% in 2018, 5.6% in 2019, 9% in 2020. Now, a function of that is, is the rise. I told you that the, it had gone up. Another function of it is the fact that overall incidents are going down, so it becomes a larger proportion of it. Um, and then within the actual incidents themselves, so that the percentages I just gave are the percentage that mental health incidents are of the total volume of incident. Now I'm going to talk about the percentage of mental health incidents that involve a use of force. And for 2016, it is 3.2. For 2017, it is 2.0. For 2018, it is 1.8. For 2019, it is 2.0. And for 2020, where incidents became 9% of the total volume and, and really increased, it is 1.5. It is uh, the, the least of, of those years that we've tracked. So force does not happen all that often in these incidents, but officers are nevertheless called to the scene. I think there are a couple of interesting things here as we plan for other kinds of, as we roll out the CSLs, the community support liaisons and their mental health work and what they're gonna help us with, as we talk about Burlington developing a crisis response system that is similar to what other cities have, as we talk about augmenting Howard Center's capacities as well, what is the true scope of this, this work? It's not a huge component of the call volume that police deal with. So it's not, even if getting all these systems fully up and fully funded and fully functional is not drastically going to reduce police call incidents. And a, a significant portion of these, I don't know how many yet, but a significant portion of these that ultimately become a police incident are still going to be police incidents, even if mental health uh, capacities exist. Because they're going to be incidents that have already evolved to a place where they're unsafe, where there's danger involved, and where mental health responders are not going to want to go without police. What we hope is that by doing this and then pushing it forward several years down the road, we can have, a, will become an upstream solution to these so that the overall proportion of mental health incidents goes down because these things are getting addressed at earlier stages than when they have to become a police incident. And so while I don't see this being something that, that drastically reduces the strain on officers with regard to overall call volume, I do see this as something that has a tremendous possibility for creating a better situation for officers overall and, the, and, and our community overall. And that is in keeping with, with the last point that I'll make about, um, about where we are, which is uh, drug complaints. I, I've heard from some members of this body, I've heard from many members of the public uh, that we are experiencing more issues with drug complaints around, the, around our community. That's open air dealing, that is signs of traffic inside a specific location. Um, our drug unit currently has two detectives. Uh, and over the past two years, the number of drug tips has increased significantly. So to the extent that tips to our drug hotline are proxies for activity, um, in 2015, there were 142. In 2016, there were 120. In 2017, there were 83. In 2018, there were 41. And that decrease over that time period coincides with the development of the CompStat model under Chief Del Pozo. It coincides with, with a, a real effort on the part of the Burlington Police Department and then tons of other community partners to really get at the opioid epidemic. Uh, and that decrease in, call, in tips is indicative of just less overt signs of that kind of activity that is causing community members to say, this is happening and it worries me and I want to report it. In 2020, however, in 2019, it started to go up, 71. So as I said, 41 was the low point in 2018. 71 in 2018 and 2019. In 2020, 172. And that is in keeping with a drastic increase in overdoses that we saw in 2020. We lost focus on the opioid epidemic because of the pandemic. Um, and then 2021 year to date, that's year to date right now is 126. So it's not cooling down. 
We are trying to apply what resources we have to those kinds of cases. We're addressing some situations that, again, that, that even members of the, the police commission have brought to us by proxy as, as members of the community. Um, but uh, that is, that's indicative of, of some real uh, issues in the community. We have uh, a concern about, um, we have a concern about this mental health, about mental health and the uptick in that, and we have a concern about the uptick in reported narcotics activity as well. So uh, again, I apologize for not being able to share this visually and the rest of the graphs, et cetera, but it'll keep me shorter and I am through. <laughs> Thank you for that, Chief. Um, any just questions just a general comment. comment. You could also consider the substance abuse um, also as a mental health issue. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Those are absolutely co-occurring and substance use right. disorder is, is often a, a symptom of other kinds of mental health right. disorders. Thank you, I have to head out there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Can we keep track? Can we keep track? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So I don't have the I don't have the stat for fatal right now, okay. but I do know that year to, and these are and now the numbers I'm about to give are all year to date. Um, that is through uh, 927 in each respective year. In 2017, there were 52 overdoses. In 2018, there were 42. In 2019, there were 34. There was real success on on that front. Uh, in 2020, there were 71 at this point in the year, and thus far this year, there have been 98. Uh, August saw the most, the largest number of overdoses that we responded to via Valcor uh, that we've ever seen. That's a good barometer for the community as a whole, sadly. Uh, any further questions from the chief with regards to the report? Commission. Hearing any, uh, she thank for that. Uh, moves on to agenda item 7.01, mental health summit resolution. And uh, before I hand it off to Susie, um, if, uh, I'll let me say, are you Corporal Vernon? Mm -hmm. Corporal Vernon, uh, feel free to join us at the table if you like. Thank you. do that first? experience and the experience of your colleagues in the forest in terms of mental health? Sure. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty broad topic. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm struggling to figure out where to start with that. Um, yeah, I suppose my, my, my experience, I, I have a lot of frustration with kind of our role in the mental health um, and in the community's response to mental health. No, I, I'm a police officer, I went to the academy for 16 weeks and somehow my profession is now being tasked with being like a first responder to, to uh, a lot of mental health crises. When you look at QMHPs, um, people who are also legally allowed to write uh, emergency evaluations, you know, from, from job descriptions I've looked at, they're at a master's level um, education, but for some reason it's, it's been seemed appropriate that police officers respond and are expected to do the same job the same standard. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of frustration there. Um, so there's another frustration I have with the mental health. Um, not, not just mental health, but mental, or mental health and um, the criminal justice system uh, start to interact with each other. Um, you know, I, I was reading this resolution, uh, whoever wrote it, they got, they got a, lot of, a lot of points there. Um, or sorry, they, they were very accurate in a lot of points. One of the, the points that I'd like to expand on is, is, is that interaction between criminal justice and, and mental health. Um, really, when, when you see somebody who is mentally Ill committing a crime and then they, they're not, they're, they're deemed um, not competent to stand trial, you know, that's, that's all well and good, but then they're passed off to the Department of Mental Health with a, you know, a non-hospitalization order and that non-hospitalization order states Things to the effect of that person is um, responsible for their own schedule, responsible for their own medi uh, taking their own medication, responsible for making appointments, and you know those two things don't really. It, it doesn't really make sense when you think about it. You're, you, you're you're not you're not responsible enough to be held accountable for the criminal acts, but at the same time you're responsible enough to get your help, yourself the help you need to be you know you know uh, somebody who's not going to commit crimes in the community. 
those, those two things, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you look at it, uh, you know, kind of from a bigger picture. So yeah, no, there's a lot of, definitely a lot of um, frustrations from a police officer's point of view with, with mental health. I don't think police are ever going to be removed from um, responding to the kind of mental health issues. You know, there's a lot of public safety aspects around mental health. Um, however, I, you know, I, I do feel it's inappropriate for a police officer to be sent first. You know, it's inappropriate for the police officer. It's, it's even more inappropriate for the person in that mental health crisis. Like, they're looking for help, and you, you're sending somebody who's not trained uh, to the standard that they should be to, you know, give that first line of help. So, I suppose. That'll be my insight in a nutshell. Thank you. No problem. We open up for everyone to have a comment if they have one. Uh, no, I, I, uh, I'll go first. No, I understand what you're saying. Uh, thank you for bringing that to your attention and evaluating the, the resolution. Give us you know, your side of you know, how you see things on a daily basis as far as you know, being in the community. Being called to these situations. Thank you. I appreciate it. I have a question. I was just curious. Um, are uh, the officers as a whole aware of the cohorts model that um, is being brought to Burlington, and do they support that? I'm not, I'm not sure if the officers as a whole um, know about it. I, I, just being from watching, I think it was either last meeting or the meeting before, watching the people speaking that, I'm somewhat aware about. Um, I, I welcome any additional resource, mental health resources that could help me do my job better. So, yeah, I'd be, I, I'd definitely be supportive of it. Supportive of it. So. If uh, you don't mind, I'd love to send you an article on it because yeah, I, I think it would be um, a great resource for our community and they have proven to be, well, number one, once the initial investment is done, mm -hmm. they ultimately end up saving a lot of money and take a lot of, a lot of this stuff off the hands of officers or also provide um, teamwork, teamwork yeah. where it's needed in, in um, areas where, you know, safety is, a, is an issue. So I'd love to, to send that because I think it'd be, um, it's really great to have that, to have officers fully aware that this is something that we're trying to get up and going in the city of Burlington and to be supportive of it because I think it would address a lot of concerns um, that you just spoke about. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'd love to read it. There's just listen to the statistics that were provided at that meeting. Yeah, there are some phenomenal statistics, so I'd love to see how, 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 how it's achieved and figure out if we can do something here. I'm going to say, uh, just from all my years I've spent bartending uh, across the street, is seeing, you know, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the calls that, you know, that you guys have to respond to for people like, uh, you know, like to hang out in the corners there. And we always comment, like, <laughs> like, there's really not much you guys can do about some of these things, you know, or like, or I guess better put, like you said, like, yes, yes, you guys all have master's degrees in, like, you know, um, Social work's like kind of to diagnose these kind of things, and we always kind of find it frustrating. Just it seems like yeah, a complete lack of resources that you guys have for that, and very much in support of the mental health resolution that, that was drafted up. Um, I like how it pointed out a lot of this, uh, the deficiencies in there, and I really hope that um, something really good comes out of this in you know, that couple months. And um, this whole video is convened. So, thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing the work. Appreciate it. Thank you. So anybody else have a comment? So now I'd like to introduce the um, the resolution more formally for all of us to have any last comments on. Um, I'm just going to read the resolution out loud. Burlington Police Commission resolution urging citywide mental health summit. And I guess I would say this this to me is like it addresses both some of the holes in our services, but it's also a preventative measure. It helps our community to, you know, toward wellness as a whole, which should decrease all kinds of problems as a consequence. Incidents involving mental health comprise a significant and growing challenge for the city of Burlington. These have severely impacted the Burlington Police Department, which has seen a doubling of mental health-related calls since 2012, 
Moreover, this year alone, the BPD has already recorded 645 incidents as of June 30th, 2021, that are mental health related. It is the most frequent type of call the BPD receives. Although many and perhaps most of these incidents do not involve intentional criminal conduct, they can easily lead to criminal charges and an expectation that the mental health needs will be met through the legal system rather than the mental health care system. Offices are clear that they do not have the training to be the frontline health care responders. The problem is much larger, larger and increasingly more serious that can be addressed by police response alone. Burlington is in immediate need of an effective system of care that is a collaborative network of providers that can efficiently and comprehensively respond to mental health needs. In light of the need for a comprehensive response to a growing social and health need, if not crisis, the Burlington Police Commission urges the mayor and the city council to convene a mental health summit with the goal of developing and funding a system of care. The summit should include all of the relevant parties to inform how such a system would be structured. The goal of such a summit is not merely to talk about the problem. A tangible outcome should be the establishment of coordination among relevant parties with regular meetings to review data and progress in developing protocols to meet mental health needs. The following are examples of the organizations and people to be included in the summit. Mental Health First Burlington, National Alliance of Mental Illness, NAMI, Northeast Family Institute, United Way, Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health, Howard Center, Pathways Vermont, First Call, BPD, uh, Burlington Fire Department, Burlington City Council, Public Safety Committee, Chittenden County State's Attorney's Office, Chittenden County Public Defender's Office, REIB Office, representatives from the BIPOC and LGBTQ communities, representatives from the New American Community, AALB, Somali Bantu Organization, and Bhutanese Community Organizations, et cetera, Vermont Family Network. I'm adding in Center for Responder Wellness, which is not in the draft. UVM Medical Center, Vermont Department of Mental Health, UVM Dean of College of Education and Social Services, because they, they really prepare both social workers and mental health clinicians. We urge this summit to be organized within the next three months and no later than December 2021. In our role as commissioners, we see the impact of mental health on policing and the holes in our services. We emphasize the need for action is urgent. Comments from commissioners? Um, I think uh, the addition, those like those last three or four um, organization uh, additions, I think are excellent. And um, I feel, uh, yeah, absolutely, we should uh, amend, amend uh, the resolution to add those in there. Susie, can you speak to those? Are you done? Oh, yes, I'm done. Can you speak to the process of, I know we all had the ability, but did, I think you also presented it to the chief. Are there others who had a chance to look at it and vet it? I don't know that part of it. I, I, did, piece, I did pieces of it. Okay. Stephanie did pieces of it. Chief, but I'm not sure about that. Is this that. something that you... I did. I saw it and, and provided some feedback on, on some of the language in there. Um, yeah, the, 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 again, one of the things that I just pointed out uh, is that that's, not the, uni that's the universe of mental health issue calls uh, as opposed to things that, that conceivably have a mental health component through right. a checkbox. Um, but yeah, I did see it, and I was, I was very glad okay. to. I just wanted to make sure that our representations that are on behalf of officers in the department were, you know, that you and the officers have seen those. Great. Um, this is on board docs, correct? Correct. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to reiterate that for the public, that they have access to view that on board docs. Um, so I'll maybe have a question for the city attorney here. Um, with, I guess, uh, the amendments of like just adding those, I think, like three or four other organizations to it. Just one. Oh, yeah. just one? Yeah. Okay. Um, then I, I, I propose that we adopt um, this resolution, amending that we add that one organization that was stated and not uh, explicitly put on uh, the, um, the, the document that's on board docs. Well, let me make sure I understand just the point of clarification um, what the uh, commission is intending to do. So 
for this resolution, is this intended to be just like a, a statement that the um, commission is adopting, or is the intent that this is moving forward to city council? The intent is that it's a document a resolution that's supported by the police commission that goes to the mayor. Um, and we're asking the mayor to take action on this. Okay, um, so if the intent is for this to go to the mayor, that can be accomplished in a couple of different ways, right? We can take just like a vote um, that we support what's included in here, and it can be just communicated to the mayor, <coughs> like it literally just communicated to him by the chair, or emailed to him. If you're wanting this to be a more formal communication, um, I would suggest that it move through the process of seeking a sponsor and be communicated to him um, in the format of city council with mayor presiding or just city council um, meeting. So I guess if the intent is just for him to, to be aware that this is something that the commission supports and just take, you know, an informal a, a vote to to adopt or to to ratify what's in here, but to make it you know binding for commission. If the if the intent of the commission is that it moves forward um, in the city council process, like just a vote in commission is not going to achieve that. The the process would be to get a sponsor either by city council committee or an individual or group of. Um, uh, city councilors to bring it to the next meeting for presentation to the mayor. So I just want to be clear. Yeah, we, I'm sorry, I forgot to say we're also going to be sending this to the president of the city council. So it'll be both parties. Okay, so it could just be a uh, communication to them. Like if you could just send it to them and say, you know, we would like this to be a communication at the next meeting. Um, but if the intent is for this to be a resolution that's ultimately passed and ratified by city council, is that the intent? So the, the, yeah, the intent is you want them to actually convene the group and make the thing happen. Sure, but it, I'm, and I understand that, but it's, so the intent then is for them to actually pass this resolution in a city council meeting? I think so. I think yes. Yeah, because yeah, okay. uh, so it's like binding. So like they kind of have to then act on it. So okay. I would say yes. So if the intent is for the city council to pa to pass a resolution. I think the the procedure here is that you know we can take take an informal vote that everybody agrees that the commission is supportive of this. But in order for a resolution to go before city council, it has to be sponsored. And so we would need to then seek a sponsor either through the form of a committee or a one you know individual counselor. And so that would be sort of the next step um, in the process. So I would suggest that, um, I'm just looking at your agenda here too. The, what I see on the agenda is discussion and information for this. So I don't know that a vote on this was formally warned. I'm not sure. I'm just looking at what's available on board docs. Um, and so I, you know, I would suggest that you can can get your draft in in working order tonight. Um, everyone generally agree on the particular on the particulars of the draft. Then if you want to have a, a formal vote, I would formally warn that for the next meeting. Once you do that, the next step again would be to go through the formal city council process would be to seek out that sponsor, whether it's a committee or individual counselor. So I hope that All right, I guess point of verification. Um, it was, seeing how this is under commission actions, I, I wasn't aware that we had to warn things that we were going to vote on. I thought that was kind of um, Sorry, I'm just making sure I'm looking at the yeah. right portion of the page. Okay. So you can certainly um, take a vote um, to make certain changes to the draft resolution. And like I said, I think it's fine to. Um, to take a vote to like have the commission ratify or adopt what's in here. 
then the next step would be, I think, is just part of an informal discussion or, or a more formalized vote would be, okay, what is, what is our next step in terms of presenting this to whoever we are going to seek out as our sponsor? So that might be part of the discussion moving forward once we're all in agreement on this draft, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I think so. That makes sense. Susie, Susie did mention that it would be going to the, the mayor and uh, Vice Tracy. So could I propose something? Could we as a group, I think we all agree on the content, but we'll find out. But I think we're, I think this draft is all something that we support and we'll see. I don't want to speak for folks, but presuming that that's the case, could we not vote that um, we would like this to go to someone, you know, a sponsor, probably the public safety committee and if they don't take it up, if someone won't agree to present it as a resolution, we would, as an alternative, want it to be a communication to the mayor and to the city council so yeah. that we cover both bases. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing's preventing the commission from just submitting it um, as a communication to the city council and you know, presuming that the president will place it on the agenda, nothing is preventing them from just accepting it as a communication without a sponsor, um, if ultimately we go, go that route. So it's, but obviously as the commission, I'm sure is aware, communication is a little bit different. They're just accepting it as information, not necessarily taking any action on it versus putting it forth as a resolution of the sponsor requires council action. So it, they'd be getting the information either way, but without that sponsor um, and putting it forth as a formal resolution, there would be no no action taken mm -hmm. by the council. So I guess I, what I would like to do is send it as a, a communication to the, to the mayor and to Max Tracy, and then we have a sponsor, uh, I think so, uh, from the city council. So I think your suggestion is a good one. Okay. You want to move down? Why don't you move okay. Okay. So I'm going to make a motion. Um, do you first want us to have, do a motion on whether we are we approve the content of this? That we all agree on the content. Of yes, this? I think that would make the most sense. Okay. And the addition like of what there what might have been. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to move that the draft that was included with the agenda be approved with the one edition of CARES. So the Center for Responsive. So responsive wellness, responder wellness. So that's my motion. Uh, all in favor? Sorry, just a quick point of procedure. I would ask for discussion on okay. this. Any discussion on that? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be the one calling for it. Sorry. All good. Sorry. Okay, real good. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Raise your hand and say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Okay, so I'm going to do a second motion, and I'm going to move that we communicate this as adopted to the city council and to the mayor, uh, and that we also seek a sponsor. Do we I'm want a pub public safety committee? committee? Pardon me? I'm thinking public safety the committee. The public safety committee um, as the sponsor to take this. Uh, I will leave it at that, short and sweet. That's the motion. So the mayor. City, city Council through Max Tracy mm -hmm. and sponsor. Yep. I'll second that. Uh, I guess uh, discussion. Yeah, discussion. Not seeing or hearing any. Go ahead. All in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Thank yeah. you, Susie, for doing the work. Well, Stephanie did a lot too. Well, thank you both. And a lot of people did. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, we that uh, closes out agenda item 7.01 at the House Senate resolution. Um, thank you, Corporal Byrne, for being with us. Yes, um, thank appreciate you. it. Um, Thanks. Next time. Um, all right, next agenda item is uh, All right, uh, next agenda item is a uh, staff person for the BPC. BPC. Um, so, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so I forget, I forget exactly when, but um, several months ago, um, Councilor Hightower, Zaria Hightower, um, 
uh, made an initial request, oh sorry, back in June um, for some funds for us to have a staff person. And, and, uh, and I guess uh, that was included into the FY22 budgeting process. Um, we have not, we've yet to be uh, allocated a person for that, uh, but I don't know if and when that will actually happen. But I think it would be a good idea to um, kind of, I guess, get the job description or at least like our job requirements that will be needed and to kind of like kind of get that in order so that whenever that does come happen, we kind of start to hand up your paper like these are the things we need from you and kind of go from there. I saw your hand raised. I was just going to say that we're trying, and maybe you said this and I wasn't listening, but we are trying to get clarification on exactly what is the position. Was it approved for a certain, uh, was it approved for data, for example, analysis or gathering? And also, what portion of a position is it? Because I think that will help guide us in terms of designating what this person mm -hmm. um, could help the commission with. Uh, and we, it, it's taken, it's been several weeks since re we requested it. So. Okay, no. Uh, well, I guess like, some of the things that jumped out to me was like, um, you know, obviously taking our minutes, you know, essentially I guess it kind of replaced a lot of the work that Shannon does, because, and with that being said, Shannon I think goes above and beyond, um, but uh, in her dues from helping us out at the end of the day, that's not really her position is right. to be doing these things for us, you know? Um, she's your assistant, and, and but like well, that, like I said, this is not by any means um, a tactical risk that she does for us, right. and I think we're all very grateful for everything that she does for us, and she bends our back for a lot of things. But end of the day, that's not her job, and we should really, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, something that kind of stuck out to me was obviously taking, like, taking minutes, tracking complaints, uh, organizing, posting the agenda to, you know, board docs, MPAs, getting it out there, um, keeping track of uh, our work plan, more or less, and maybe like some social media duties, you know, or, or what, which, which I guess ties into posting the agenda, kind of like getting, getting our message out there um, much better. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any, I see your hand, oh, Mila? Also, um, a separate website, like creating our own page mm -hmm. uh, within the cities. Maintaining like, uh, what? Right, like where we have our, our own page where we can really put, I mean people can go to board docs, but to really be presenting the information that we talk about in our minutes in, in a different way, and also to be providing um, references for everything we talk about, mm -hmm. like NACOL and stuff like that. You. Well, I was going to say we spend it a lot. We spend a lot of time setting up meetings. Shannon spends an inordinate amount of time helping us schedule meetings. So that would be great if we had help with that. Any other uh, thoughts or comments on this? Maybe we just um, talk to Shannon. I know what her duties have been mm -hmm. in all of the years. All right. Probably help us get a better description. Yeah. Good idea. Uh, I think that was kind of short and sweet. Um, so the fact is, my further conversation or discussion on this, I'm happy to close this. Uh, all right. Moving on to agenda item 7.03. Um, so I guess uh, this will be uh, meeting places updates. I'm not sure, Mila, if anyone got back to you, some of the questions you had reached out to them with. Um, I feel that we have to table this at least for a month. Okay. So I got some more responses regarding some of the other places I was looking into. And everyone right now is being very cautious because mm -hmm. of the surge in cases. So locations that normally allow public meetings are not doing so mm -hmm. at this time. But they're all like, give us a call, you know, in a month or so, let's see where we're at. So I believe it's something that we do want to ultimately pursue, but once we get into a, um, 
I guess a better place where people feel, yeah, it's going to be safe to have people come back to these meeting places. I would like to see us make sure that these meetings are hybrid meetings. Mm -hmm. um, I know we had an unusual situation tonight where we had to be down this room, but I don't think there wasn't a Zoom link for this meeting. So I think we want to make sure um, the city council is up and running with hybrid meetings. So that technology is now set up to do so. So we definitely need to be making sure that um, we're hybrid as well. Even moving around to a different location, um, you know, I have been asking specifically about the, the technical availability to be able to do hybrid meetings, but um, certainly while we're in this building, we should be able to do that. Thank you. No, thank you. I think that's really important. It opens up the, you know, our work throughout the city to anybody who might be interested. And people do go on Zoom when they look. So I think that's a great suggestion. All right. Um, close that agenda item. Um, moving on to 7.04. Uh, commission email communication protocol. Um, and I, I'll let you take a fork at this, so I think one of yours. So, I, I think I say this perpetually, but I'm only three and a half months mm -hmm. in, and I'm still learning so much. Yeah. Uh, so I have some just general questions that maybe we just think about, maybe you, you don't decide tonight, but I wanted to table them. Do we have a policy or practices around commissioners speaking to the media? If we do, what is it, and how does it work? So can we, you want us to answer as we go along? That would be good. Okay, so I know of nothing like that. You don't have to know, okay. But, but that's just, I'm not aware of anything like that. And I, sorry, let me pull up. There it is, there's that. Um, me personally, I guess, as, ch as, ch as chair, um, I have no, I have, I have no problem with anyone speaking to the media. Um, I, if they reach out to you um, and you feel comfortable speaking to them, by all means speak to them. Um, I, I guess all that I ask is that like whatever your comments are, it's like, every, like this state, like I'm not speaking for the entire commission. This is my personal thoughts on it. Um, because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I never, I never not want you to think that you can't say something. You know, like. That's that's not not how I run things. Like if you want to talk, if they reach out to you, you want to talk, by all means. Um, so, sorry, uh, Mila. Um, I think, and it's something that's come up before, but with everything that's been going on, it kind of gets sidetracked because I I went through what you're going through right now. I mean, there's a big learning curve. Yeah. There's always a lot going on. And we kind of get thrown into the position. And I feel like we need a little like police commission handbook. That that should be one of the things related to that question and then some of the other questions that you have. Because we literally don't get anything. Mm -hmm. We're just like, there you go. You know, even the rules that we're supposed to follow for the meeting, you know, I remember asking Eileen Blackwood, do you, do you have something written down? Oh, you just follow these rules and But you know, then we get called out if we do something wrong because no one, um, and, and then, you, you know, we have the city attorney representative here now, but we didn't have that. And people were like, you did that on that meeting and you shouldn't have done that that way, but no one was here to, to counsel or provide documentation. So I think it's one of these things we need to add to our list, and even if we're working on it slowly, making some kind of progress um, addressing these these issues. You know, and, and you know everything that you just said, I agree with. But we should write it down, and maybe you know we reference a statement, and we can say, well, this is my personal opinion about the statement. Um, because we know, I mean, we've all get media requests. Um, and Th that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help us to have, you know, sort of more clear policies. Um, and and I, I just, 
I don't think we're deciding every tonight because everybody's not here, you know, but, mm -hmm. but I do think we need to talk about this. So the second question is, how do we come to, a, to public positions that are joint commission decisions that need to be reported to the media? How do we know that we've made such a decision? Is it recorded someplace accessible to the public? That's my second question. My third one is, do we have a policy and procedure around who speaks for the commission and when? I ask this because when individual commissioners respond to the press, who are they speaking for? Are they speaking for the commission or themselves? And how does the media report it? And then the last one uh, is, after some deliberative discussion, I suggest we create a policy and record it somewhere so that new commissioners can continue settled policy and practices in this area. And then the, the last part is, which is not on what I sent earlier, um, what are our email communication policies? And I'm just suggesting at this point, we might wanna, each one of us, write something down in, in the spaces here for the next meeting and then come to some closure together, some decisions, make a policy and figure out, maybe on that web, that page someone was you were talking about, we start compiling some of this information so it's publicly available to both commissioners, new commissioners, old commissioners, and our city. I'm happy to, I guess, draft something um, in response to these, these questions here. Um, that might be, I guess, more or less a beginning of essentially a handbook, per se. Um, and then if other people want to also maybe put their input on those individual things, and we'll come back next month or whenever we, we, we schedule this into our agenda to try to come up with something. But yeah, um, I'm happy to put up an initial draft and then kind of get feedback from, or, or, or hear feedback on these questions from other people and then incorporate that into something. So um, just to go back to what you were talking about, I noticed like with councilors, uh, city councilors, they speak to the media and usually when they speak to the media it, it's just what they how they feel and what, how they they're looking at a, a certain situation so with that being said if we do want to have someone I'm just going to make a suggestion if we do want to have someone speak for us as a whole maybe we can apply that to the, the staff position as well so she can mm -hmm. or he can put that out to the public and the, the media as a body but just as yeah, on those rare occasions where we agreed on yeah. something. No, I mean, really, it's very difficult to get seven people to work. You know, it yeah. just, it's very difficult because our inclination is to do something at, on something that's contemporaneous, right? Right. But to get us together and seven people, it, it proves much more difficult. So in, in past experience, it has just been difficult to have a joint statement. Yeah as opposed to something we work on together in an open meeting. I just have a point of information for the commission. I'm happy to advise on this, um, and I can connect uh, offline with the chair and vice chair about this. This also might be something that uh, would be appropriate to enter an executive session for at a future meeting to receive some legal advice from your council on, um, on this topic. It's not something I'd like to, to offer advice on the open portion of the meeting for obvious mm -hmm. reasons, but I'm happy to advise on maybe just some guardrails and, and parameters to think about. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, any further discussion? comments, questions regarding this? Well, it? just, I, I do think you know already that when a complaint comes in, those um, typically come to the chair and me, and that the minute it comes into my box, we just have it decided that I forward it to all of you. And mm -hmm. the only response that goes out to the individual is an acknowledgement of receipt of that mm -hmm. complaint. So that's, that is pretty much our only real policy where we really have something that is, you know, we stick to it. Do you have it writing anywhere? Um, I thought it was on your chart, to be honest. Maybe it's on the chart. I think chart. it is. Yeah. yeah. I did ask for permission to respond to a couple complaints, but I didn't yeah. go through. Yeah, and that's, yeah. I mean, nothing is saying, like I agree that we would never tell someone they can't communicate. It's just they, yeah, it would always be on their own behalf and not for the commission, right? Unless we, as they've heard from every commissioner, that we're in agreement. Well, that's the, that's the challenge with the meeting too, though, right? 
Right. Yeah, so we have to really be yes. on point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that comes in the next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, any further questions or comments? All right. Uh, close that agenda item. We're going to agenda uh, item 7.05 uh, strategic plan on racial disparities and use of force, requesting a revised plan. Um, and yeah, uh, we've been kind of bringing this up, you know, a fair amount. Um, and I, I think this is just for us, and please chime in, anyone else that wants to. Um, maybe looking for something a bit more concrete uh, in terms of like how to, how to address these things. And I, and I know we've heard uh, from before that like, you know, like you, you, res you get respond to calls that happen and these, these people, uh, and these are, you know, you're, 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 responding, you're responding to calls for service. And I don't know, maybe some ask how we you know, work a little bit better, but it's just, just to really just take like a, I think, you know, a deep dive or look into this and just it, it see if there are ways that could help could help kind of bring these numbers down. Because um, it's it's I think I know Christian Sorino said it before, but like but they, it's it's pretty high uh, compared to uh, compared to others compared to the other people in the city, and yeah, I don't know. It's maybe, hopefully, maybe, maybe next month might be a short app, but maybe like two months, maybe have some a bit more kind of a s solid plan and to kind of address like how we can kind of uh, help these numbers out. Um, so I think that we have we have some ideas for, for that. Uh, I think their ideas, you know, we're, we're at a stage now where. You, you, uh, the body doesn't want them read anymore, but we we were presenting them publicly. Mm -hmm. We still are in written form. They're up there. Every single one can be reviewed and 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 looked at by any citizen or member of the public. Um, and furthermore, this body has the ability to see all of them on body camera if they so choose. Uh, we are hopeful to be get a. Uh, I I do have a job description in the works for a position that was allotted to us in this fiscal budget. Um, for a redaction specialist that would allow us to not only have you able to see every single one, but to actually put every single one out in the public view. That's the strategy. I would like to, I would like to know where these, these issues are in these, in these things that are now wholly public um, and uh, where we are going to make even more of it public insofar as allowing people to see each incident. And then where, you know, if, if there are patterns in there, this body has not identified them. If there are, um, you know, indications of, of specific, uh, either either situations or, uh, you know, we're we're, even, we're working on a way of presenting it with officers, uh, anonymized, but anonymized in a standard way that would allow there to be some flag of saying, you know, this officer is appearing, uh, and what do we is is there something there? So um, those are those are efforts that, that we're making in the department. Uh, Deputy Chief Sullivan has just finished a, an extensive review of every single use of force from 2020. We review every single use of force when they happen, and, and they get reviewed by members of the department who are trained in use of force instructors and use of force reviewers. Uh, they get reviewed by those officers who then go back to the uh, officers involved to say, if there's a problem or, or if there's something that needs to be clarified or if there's a real issue they raise it to a supervisor or if they're not a supervisor themselves and, and begin a disciplinary process if appropriate um, they also uh, then gets reviewed now it, there's an extra layer of review by dc lebrec that he every month he's producing this report for this body uh, and then as i said there's the annual report dc sullivan has done and then we are hopeful to make available to the public what we've already made available to you, which is the ability to watch every single one. Um, that is that is the strategy for identifying what is in front of us or not. Because the it's going to be in those incidents, in the granular incidents of saying, where what is the, the pattern of, of how officers respond that isn't part of behavior to which they are responding? Thank you for that. Floor is open for any questions. Am I correct in that you were asking uh, 
how to bring the numbers down. Or maybe, sorry, I guess I was um, not, pro I didn't probably say that right, not bring numbers down, because that means that's implying that uh, trying to cut the numbers, I don't want that. Um, but I guess it was like, try to find, uh, are there patterns of bias that, uh, that, are, that are affecting uh, you know, mainly BIPOC people uh, as as their share of the community for for these incidents. Mila. So, um, this has been discussed for months. There are patterns of racial disparities um, in the department. And I would like to hear further um, what you're doing to look at patterns by officers or shifts. I think that's really important because in the past when we've asked for certain information, even knowing that we have to review it in executive session, we've been told no. And then we were told that the disparities were due to warrants. And then the yearly report came out and said, well, based on the previous discussion about the disparities being due to warrants, we looked at that and we determined that it's not due to warrants. So there, and then trying to get information on training, um, because I, I've really had to sit and listen to some stuff where I'm like, Literally, do you hear the words coming out of your mouth? It shows um, a, a lack of understanding, a, a lack of cultural competency, uh, if we want to use that term. But it tells me that people, even at a leadership position, have certain biases that they're not aware of, and that officers are out in the street with some of these biases. And I don't know. You know, one of the, the speaker we had, was it the last meeting they talked about how the training, bias training had to change because current bias training just is not proving to be effective, right? And then Sonny earlier was, you know, very eloquent in what he talked about in terms of how people need to come together and talk to each other. And we have a department where most of the officers don't live in the community. They don't. And we have rapid diversification within the community. We've had some unfortunate incidents where, like, literally training went out the window. And what you're left with is to say, hey, this was biased. You know, would this have happened if this person was white? Probably not. You know, when we look at the Jerry Milley case, which sent a lot of shockwaves to the community, it really changed things for a lot of people in terms of you know how you look like and how it can affect how you're treated by people that you you may need to help you out um so i think being i i don't always feel that the department has been willing to take a look at that you know to take a look at patterns by officer to really focus on particular officers that may need assistance you know, we've seen reporting in the past that shows if you put certain officers in certain um, areas during certain times of day, that they're more likely to have use of force incidents against people of color. Now, is that because of the, um, you know, are you, are you stationed downtown? And you're stationed downtown, you're gonna be dealing with more types of stuff. But there are a hell of a lot, way more drunk white people downtown than there are black people. So these are the things I'd like to see looked at, and these are the things I feel in the past when brought up, it's like, no, we're not gonna talk about that information. And I think we need to talk about that information, even if you talk about it in an executive session, even if you just say that you're doing it, because really, now is really the first time that you, you said that you're looking at that um, and looking at what particular officers might be doing. Um, and then having a frank conversation, I always feel that bias training has just gotten a raw deal. It's like, what bias training do you do? Well, we do bias training. Well, what bias training do you do? 
we do bias training. That literally has is, is been the example. Um, and since I don't want to go off with another monologue or a soliloquy, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mila. Uh, any further questions or comments on this agenda item? Not seeing or hearing any. Uh, so moving on to agenda item 8.01. And uh, obviously, we're not, we don't need to hear the whole report written out, but does anybody have any questions that, uh, with regards to this uh, use of force report? Any questions that I think they can narrow down that wouldn't be needed in the executive session? No. Um, I have one question. Um, And this is with regards to number 10. Um, I believe that was the one where it was uh, UPMPD. Yeah. Um, so most most of that occurred uh, before uh, Burlington PD showed up. Um, yes, yeah, some of it did. I mean, it, the, they actually did call us. They were at Gene Nance. I guess okay. the building doesn't really matter. That's their property, even though it's in yeah. Burlington, obviously, on Pearl Street. Um, okay, that's, there was, there that's was a huge home. clarifying thing. Okay, uh, yeah. I thought it was like more like on campus proper. Uh, so. No, no, they were right there, and uh, there was an alarm going off. I don't know what it was, but they were trying to investigate what was going on, and this intoxicated male kept coming up to them, and they were trying to concentrate on figuring out why this alarm was going off, obviously for the safety reasons. And then um, after a while, they called us to like this guy is just completely, you know, getting in the way of us trying to like figure out what's going on there, and. You know, we ended up dealing with them and our officers, you know, it's all, okay, you know, you just need to leave. And he left and kept coming back and left, you know, multiple times where the officers just like, like please, you know, just go home. It's, it's okay, you know. And, at, you know, obviously it got to the point where he was making decisions like, so if we leave, is he going to continue with the, um, you know, the UVM officers? Uh, or is he just going to pick somebody who's walking up and down the street? Like, he's obviously going to put himself in a situation where maybe he gets himself in a fight, so they, tr they took, they try to take him into protective custody. Um, and I just want to clarify for everyone, uh, Gene Mance is on Pearl Street, about four or five buildings up, yeah. four or five houses up from yeah. the corner of um, Pearl and Willard. Right across from the old Taft School. All right, cool. Just, that, that, I, I, I didn't care about And he did. I did. I, I was able to get the BAC in that one. He was a point two oh three, which is... All right, that was, that was my only question for our house to clarify one. So the chief asked, he's like, did you the MPD really call us? I was like, yes, but it was, they had a good reason. Uh, anybody have any further questions on the Age Force report? No. No. All right. Uh, can I just, I just want to point out, uh, we were talking about lessons learned and stuff like that. Um, we did deal with, uh, on the end there, there's a missing juvenile, and then there was a chins uh, with this uh, young man that is on the uh, spectrum. He's functioning. Uh, but he had, these are just two in here, but we have dealt with him also in the past. So it was one of those ones where officers knew uh, who he was, um, that he did run away from home a lot. He would just be in like his adult diaper. Uh, this first call was at like three in the morning when the mom heard the alarm go off on the door. So there are things in place, um, and then we got a 911 call almost immediately. Like there was a somebody running down the belt line um, uh, in a di wearing a diaper. Uh, so the, you know, the, I think this is a good example of like where officers really tried to slow things down or at least make them safe. We ended up closing the belt line on that one, just shutting it down so we weren't getting any traffic because our biggest worry was him getting hit by a car. Um, and then they, you know, they followed along and um, got the mother on scene in this one and, you know, tried to talk to him. He was uncooperative um, and he was getting near, you know, the end of, yeah, that was quite a distance he covered from, you know, Manhattan Drive all the way down to the, the um, Ethan Allen homestead. Um, but, um, you know, they, at this point, you know, they, they tried to secure him and they did. It was, it was a very low level, just putting him in handcuffs, getting back in the cruiser. Um, and, you know, we had in the past dealt with him where we've just been able to put him in the cruiser without having to put any handcuffs on him. But in this situation, he just was, you know, he was getting near the uh, guardrails of the overpass, 
or obviously we didn't want him to like leap over the side or something like that. Uh, and then almost, I think date-wise, I believe the next call was the next morning. Uh, and once again, he was found kind of in the same area, but this time with rush hour traffic. And once again, we were, you know, the officers are aware of him um, and they're trying to like, they did drive up and open the cruiser door because that had happened, worked in the past where he would just walk over and get in the cruiser, <laughs> shut the door and drive him back down to mom. In this case, that didn't work, but I mean, one of the officers literally like kind of threw themselves in front of him so he wouldn't get, you know, struck by a car. So I just think it's a good, just to point out that we are, we're trying, we're learning, we're adapting uh, when we're dealing in these situations. Um, and uh, yeah, I just thought they were like, pretty good, two pretty good examples since we had been talking about that earlier in the session. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you for that. Appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. All right, uh, has no further questions or comments with the uh, support report um, for I that have, item. I have the um, commendations if you can. All right, I was about to say, Shannon's not here, so we can't do that, <laughs> but. Um, Apparently we can. Agenda <laughs> item 9.01, commendations received uh, for July, August. Uh, so is, um, okay, so this is a communication that came in. Uh, from an individual, I spoke with Officer Kirby today regarding a late report incident where my car's dash cam recorded a possible domestic assault while parked, unattended, and the vehicle was damaged minimally. Officer Kirby was extremely professional and took the time to address my concerns. He represents Burlington PD well. There are two more letters. Uh, this is another communication description of incident. We thought our family member with memory loss had been walking without us knowing. Officer Wilson was everything one would expect of an ideal police officer, helpful, understanding, respectful, and professional. None of the tough guy, serious face, macho stuff, just a good police, thanks. Finally, this came from a community group that uses, I, I believe it uses the community space of the um, police department. Hi Shannon, just a quick note from our group and myself thanking you and BPD for your accommodations and especially the kindness being shown almost each week from your various associates. It is almost like returning home with the statement like, so glad to have your group back with us. It is showing that things are almost back to normal again and similar kind words. That is just what it feels like. Our original group of about 70 is now growing in its early stages and about 30 showing up each week. Over the years, I have always made the statement that anything I can or we can do to be of assistance in some, in some way, please let me know. Again, thank you so much. Thank you for that. I have a question. Okay. Just real quick. Um, I'm just wondering why we haven't, if we're putting on the complaints or the incident reports, use of force incident reports, mm -hmm. um, why can't we put on the uh, Accommodations well on the agenda. I'm just wondering. If Some of it is just the confidentiality of, you know, because there are oftentimes oh, it's family don't. members who, you know, so it's identifying them. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, you could redact those. Yeah, but, but this is public. I think we're in public form now. For right, so I didn't read any of the names. Okay, okay. Gotcha. And I changed, like, the uh, specific family member. I just was more general. Okay. As opposed to the, the ones themselves, which often say, you know, you came to my house at this address and interacted with my child named this, yes. and okay. it's very identifying, and so we wouldn't want, we'd want to be careful about placing those okay. in the public eye. That makes eye. perfect sense. Thanks for opening me up. All right, thank you for that. Um, we're going to jump out of 10.01, Commissioner, updates or comments? So if you have, I'm just jumping in, I'm sorry. No, you jump right in. If, so um, if you didn't hear the city council last night, the expectation is that the CNA report, the final report will issue Friday as it the anticipated release date. Thank you. I'll say welcome back you all. We missed you brother and uh, it's good to have you here back with us. Any uh, questions or comments from commissioners? Not hearing any. Uh, moving on to the next meeting, agenda items. Uh, so I've got for October 26th, ironically enough, policy issues. 
and we have listed things like taser policy, mental health policy, juvenile policy, de-escalation, person with disabilities, social media, and others. Um, we don't have someone to sort of do the wrangling to get things together for that meeting yet, so we need a volunteer. Uh, those are a lot of policy things to <laughs> well, we, maybe we're not going to get to all of them probably yeah. but you know we should decide together which ones we want to focus on and then um, we're looking at also at NACOL policies also so the tandem of what our policies here and what NACOL is mm -hmm. suggesting mm -hmm. maybe we should just pick two or three for uh, for next month yeah um well, so this might tie in. One of the agenda items is Brian Core yep. is going to come. He, he's tentatively scheduled to come in October to speak with us. I think that was the trauma informed. Yep. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, so he has tentatively said yes. We were going to schedule him for 30, 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that ties in with which policies okay, we focus on. And uh, Stephanie and I will work on the logistics of having him participate. Okay. So we're talking about trauma the next time. That there we go. Yeah, and if That's you want to be enough. involved with um, you know, how we define the scope for him because it's not much time. Yeah. You know, that's really hard to ask someone to speak for so little time. Should we leave that to you and Stephanie to kind of Or you. I mean three of us can okay. can coordinate on that. Uh, yeah, that, and I and I guess I'll have um, uh, a light draft for um, just communication protocols and kind of like how we kind of do that kind of stuff. What we talked about for seven point zero four, and I think we'll flush it out between now. And, oh, was that sorry? Was that a hand raised? I would love to have a presentation from the department. Um, since we were talking earlier about the big increase in drug activity, mm -hmm. um, I spoke to Chief Sullivan last week, who was um, very kind to give me a lot of information as I was working with some community members who presented some issues. It would be really good to know, um, like a public presentation of, of who are the, you know, there's two detectives, who are the two detectives, what's the best way to report the activity, and what type of information do you need from people? So th this particular group of uh, individuals that I'm trying to support and assist, the activity that they're describing is going beyond just huge groups of people coming to use. It's sounding like there's definitely some trafficking that's more organized going on. So, um, you know, we talked about um, what type of camera systems they could be using, but what type of information do they need to give to the police department? Um, in order to bring more um, attention or help, because this particular house is very close to uh, the sustainability academy. And there are children who live in the building where uh, this activity is going on, and it's next uh, to a place that does after school programs. So it's a really sensitive area in terms of how children are being affected. You know, if, if it goes beyond BPD and it warrants like a federal investigation, how does that happen? What's the, the process of that? I don't think people in the community understand that. You know, do they need to be providing uh, information they pick up on the camera? Do they need to be providing license plates that show like how many cars are showing up at a particular time? Um, that are out of state license plates you know, because they're describing that, you know, groups of cars showing up at specific periods of time um, as opposed to just people going in and out and, and using or making quick buys. So 
I, I think that a presentation like that would be very, very helpful uh, because as we talked about, we're, we're seeing you know increases in, in the drug use and ODs and people being um, affected by what's going on um, in certain homes. And of course, the landlord has their hands tied about evicting someone. Um, we always want to be careful about evictions, but if there ever was a reason to evict someone, this would be it, but there's an eviction moratorium and everything around COVID. Um, I just feel that that would be very interesting uh, presentation that the public would appreciate. Thank you. Great idea. Uh, I'll, I'll just jump in on that. Is that something that could be done? Uh, yes, uh, not revealing the detectives in the drug I'll, I'll, I'm going to jump in. Yeah, you, I, we don't, I don't think we need to know them because they're out there doing the work. Or, sure. or just, right, or just to say there are two, this is how you call the department with with leads or concerns or, and, and I know there's once again a lot of frustration about the resources, but there were, um, I did talk to Chief Sullivan about concerns with some responses that they had gotten that weren't, I think were born out of frustration, but still weren't appropriate. Um, someone felt they were being criticized for where they lived and um, someone else felt that they were. So I had Susie followed by you. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry. a clarifying um, question. When you say a public presentation, do you mean at one of our meetings? Or yes, yes, that was discussed at, at a meeting uh, so that people will know, hey, this was on the agenda. If you couldn't watch it live, you can go back and see this presentation and you have an idea of how you can help the department help you. So do you want to do that? Do you think it's too much to put trial and this presentation on the same night? Or should we shift it to another night? If we don't, it depends on how many other things, you know, I think this would be a robust and doable agenda what we've just talked about but i think if we continue to add it's going to and i also, I also think that that's an important thing i think that's like right. kind of takes precedent over almost a lot of things because right. that has pretty a pretty great impact on yes. on the community at large like i mean i i have some tips i, I can give you guys right now about my neighborhood yeah. about some things you know so i would very much so if we can try to I mean, we can't predict what's going to happen in the next three weeks, but I think between those two topics, that should be. Okay, so put on for next for mm -hmm. next one. Thanks. And also too, like we got to add, add other things onto it, and if you guys were going too long, we can always table those. But then if you yes. don't get to for our following meeting as yes. well too, that's always an option. Well, well we, we, we got to make sure that they have the time to yes. present. Yeah. Give us a yep. presentation. Yeah, and chief, maybe just give an IFS idea of how much time we. Yeah, so we can we'll team back with that, and, yeah. and we'll talk to Matt about sort of building on uh, a public version of what he discussed right. with Commissioner Grant, and then we'll. Great, and we know there could be robust dialogue, yeah. so we just want to set aside enough time. Yeah, well, yeah. So we'll we'll give you an estimate of that. Okay. I I just want to add, you know, as a being a landlord, I mean, I've called because I've seen some of my buildings have seen activity, and it's not that easy, <laughs> you know. This, so I would like to. Have some information on that. You know, it's one thing this is to identify and, and let the police know, but it's, it's more complicated than that. So I'd like to have more information on it too. Okay, got it. That's good. Um, no, uh, I think that's pretty pretty good agenda. So with that, uh, the committee make a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Motion to adjourn. Any discussion on adjourning the meeting? I think we should stay forever. I'm the second. <laughs> all right, all in favor of returning to the meeting, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All right, pass the unanimously. fleet. It is 8.37 p.m. Everyone, thank you for being here with us. Uh, and I'll see and talk to you all soon. And some of you all next month.